remembering a man who changed the political weather. Let us ask ourselves these simple questions. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? Friends, we are Scotland's independence generation, and our time, our time is now. Tonight, we reflect on the life and legacy of former First Minister Alex Salmond. The sudden death of Alex Salmond robbed Scotland of one of the most impactful politicians of modern times. A formidable yet often divisive figure, he took the nation closer to independence than at any time in more than 300 years. Shortly our three studio guests will reflect on a man they each knew well. But first, with contributions from across politics, Sharon Frew charts some of Alex Salmond's life and times and a report containing flash photography. Scotland has lost a political giant. I think he'll be remembered probably as the foremost Scottish politician of his lifetime. I see the newspapers um, describing him as a titan, and that is exactly the case. The most charismatic of communicators, and he left an indelible mark. He changed history. Let's be clear about that. Very few people who come here actually change history. A colossus of Scottish politics, Alex Salmond modernised the SNP and as First Minister he led the nation to the brink of independence. This is our opportunity of a lifetime and we must seize it with both hands. He commanded centre stage, dominating debate for years with his prodigy Nicola Sturgeon. But that relationship eventually broke down with lasting implications for the two of them and the wider independence movement. Alex Salmond, born in Linlithgow in West Lothian on Hugmanay 1954, was a student activist while at St Andrews in the 1970s. In the early 80s, his membership of the left-wing 79 group saw him briefly expelled from the SNP. Alex Elliot Anderson Salmond, 19,400... Yeah! He was one of three SNP MPs elected in 1987. As a representative of Bamf and Buchan, he quickly made a name for himself at Westminster, disrupting Chancellor Nigel Lawson's budget. Alex was nothing if not combative, a disputant, itching for the fight. In a sense, the adversarial ambiance of the House of Commons suited him down to the ground. When Gordon Wilson stepped down as SNP leader in 1990, the rising star defeated the favourite, Margaret Ewing, to take the top job. This is billed as a, an acceptance speech. Uh, and on reflection, I've got to tell you today, I've decided to accept. <laughs> a master campaigner, the new leader set about remoulding the party, moving it to the left and widening its appeal across many strands of Scottish life. Initially, there's no, no problem whatsoever. We were going in the same direction and we were, you know, we were twin brothers. But the more I got to know Alec, I realised, like everybody else, there's flaws. He had a wee bit of, you know, I'm the gaffer and I really don't like dissent. And that's why I decided to stand as his deputy, so that I could put salt in Alec's tail when it was required. After Labour took power in 1997, Salmond worked closely with the then Scottish Secretary Donald Dewar to campaign for the yes, yes vote in the devolution referendum. During the first ever Holyrood election, Salmond cemented his reputation as a gambler. He proposed a penny for Scotland's tax rise for education and controversially denounced NATO airstrikes against Serbia. It is an action of dubious legality but above all, one of unpardonable folly. For much of the 99 campaign, the SNP was on the back foot. The party emerged with 35 seats. In 2000, the SNP's figurehead stunned Scottish politics by quitting as leader. In the words of Hal Wilson, it's better then to, to go when they're asking why you're going. John Swinney took over, but stood down in 2004. Salmon then returns for a second, more successful time as leader, with Nicola Sturgeon as his deputy. 
Alex Salmond is selected as this Parliament's nominee for appointment as First Minister. In 2007, he led the SNP into government for the very first time, fundamentally changing Scottish politics. A raft of popular policies were rolled out, including free prescriptions and free university tuition. His ability to strategically solve problems in front of you and to, to look you know, one or two or three uh, months or years ahead even uh, was second to none and uh, he was a master politician and an orator and a debater but he was also an extremely hard working First Minister. In 2011 the SNP won an outright majority in the Scottish Parliament. I'll govern for all of the ambitions of Scotland and all the people who imagine that we can live in a better land. You take Donald Dewar. I mean, Donald's a major figure in Scottish politics. You know, the man who made it happen, he came for election. Donald couldn't get a majority because it was designed not to be so. Salmon got a majority. And he achieved the impossible. This paved the way for an independence referendum. Salmon's skills as a political operator led to this moment in 2012 with a British Prime Minister signing the Edinburgh Agreement, which gave Holyrood the power to hold a referendum on leaving the UK. It was a campaign which electrified the nation and saw Salmond go head-to-head -head with Alistair Darling, the leader of Better Together. The majority of people in Scotland vote against the Tory party. They have one MP, more pandas in the zoo in Edinburgh than Tory MPs in Scotland. On the 18th of September 2014, Scottish voters backed remaining in the UK by 55% to 45. Salmond resigned. For Scotland, the campaign continues and the dream shall never die. He returned to Westminster in 2015, but later lost his Gordon seat in a snap election. In the following years, the bond between the former SNP leader and his successor fractured completely. In 2018, he resigned from the SNP when allegations of sexual misconduct emerged, dating back to his time as First Minister. You know, I'm no perfect. I've made many mistakes in my life, political and personal, uh, but I am not guilty of harassing anyone and I am certainly not guilty of any criminality. He successfully took on the government he once led over the mishandling of the complaints. A judge ruled the process was tainted by apparent bias and Salmond won a judicial review. He believed his successor broke the ministerial code and was part of a conspiracy against him. The former First Minister went on trial in 2020 accused of multiple serious sexual offences. He was acquitted of all charges, but the pre-trial publicity and the evidence about his behaviour battered his reputation. His relationship with Nicola Sturgeon was never repaired. Today, in 2021, he formed the ALBA party ahead of the Holyrood election, but failed to make a breakthrough. Alex Salmond had a fatal heart attack on Saturday at a conference in North Macedonia. He died as he lived his life, making the case for independence. Well, we are grieving, we are looking after the interests of our family first and foremost, but as Alec always said, the dream shall never die and the cause of Scottish independence is still being pursued. He took what was effectively a minority interest, Scottish independence, Scottish nationalism, and made it uh, a mainstream piece of Scottish politics. Very, very few people could have done, could have done that. He was the one who did. There's a degree of damage done to Alec's reputation personally. Politically, that's impossible. This man was, this man was of the first rank. Well, there's the former SNP Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil, the writer and former SNP MSP Joan McAlpin, and the columnist and political commentator Brian Taylor. Thanks all for joining us. Now, Alex, you knew Alex Salmon for, what, about 40 years? Yeah. You've probably fallen in, in and out with him over that period, but you served in his Cabinet. So how have you been remembering him over the last few days? Well, first of all, with great sadness, because this is not just a loss for the independence movement, it's a loss for Scotland and indeed for British politics politics because of what Alec brought, the dimension he brought. And it's no accident that he was overseas when this happened because he was a great internationalist as well. Um, 
One of the, I was thinking the other day, or the last night, about um, how he handled the cabinet. I've compared Alec to r running in the government the way a conductor would run an orchestra. He conducted the orchestra, and then if, if anyone was out of tune, they either had to get straight back in tune or not be playing in the orchestra at all. Mm -hmm. He was a very good manager without trying to do everybody else's job. He didn't interfere with you. He let you go on with it, and he expected you to know what you had to do. Uh, and I remember one cabinet in particular uh, when the issue was whether or not to set up an inquiry into child abuse in Scotland. And Alec started the conversation by saying that he believed that we should not have a child abuse inquiry similar to the one down south. And he then went round the cabinet table uh, I was one of the ones who said, I don't agree, I think we've got to probably have our own inquiry. And a number of others took the same view as me, but the majority of the Cabinet agreed with Alec. And at the end of it, when he had gone round the Cabinet table, he then said, actually, I agree with those who actually want an inquiry. Mm. I just wanted to find out who's going to tell me what they really think <laughs> uh, and those who just tell me what they think I want to hear. And that was the kind of man he has. I mean, I, I, in my department, I remember housing was my first job, and I remember fairly junior officials telling me, the first minister stopped me today and asked me how I'm getting on with you and how well you're doing. And he was in touch with everything that went on but uh, and, and could sense when things were going wrong. And, of course, that was deliberate because he stepped in to stop things going wrong uh, unnecessarily. But he was also a tough taskmaster. And, John, you were parliamentary liaison officer to Alex Salmond when he was First Minister. Now, that, that's quite close, but it's behind the scenes. So what are you thinking of it just now? Well, Alec just reminded me of a story that you told me. I used to help with the briefings for First Minister's questions. And there was a young, a young male civil servant uh, round the table once. And he said, see that guy? He said... Uh, he, um, he was in a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago and they were talking about something that Alec knew a lot about, which I think was energy. And uh, this young man had said, uh, uh, actually, First Minister, I think you're wrong there. I think if you check the figures, yeah. And he, he was from a different department. And the next day, Alec said to his private office, I want that guy in my team because he had, mm. he had actually spoken up. Uh, He'd actually against willing Alex. to challenge yeah. him because he, he wanted that. He wanted yeah. it. And I think Jeff, Jeff Aberdeen, as Chief of Staff, said that the other day. He wanted, he wanted challenged. He's, people talk about his temper, uh, but actually he, he just loved a good debate. Brian, you've probably known Alex Salmond over the years longer than any of the rest since, of us from his university since we were days at university in together, Yeah, a university together when he, when he used to um, stoat about in, in with long hair and what I was cheeky enough to call a Maoist cap. <laughs> but at the, at the time I was wearing a cloak and a fedora, so who am I to talk? You know, so I, I know Absolutely you, I know, no one at all the, that the pictures have been suppressed, Colin, don't even try. But I mean, people sometimes describe Alex Salmon as, as a divisive figure, and I think that's primarily supporters of the union who feared his powerful advocacy on, on, on the cause of nationalism, because he was a very powerful advocate for the cause of nationalism. But he made two distinctions. He, he was a cultural nationalist and, and a, a social nationalist, but he played that side down because he said there were plenty advocating that course, and so he advocated the, the, the business economic and, if you like, populist arguments for, for independence. At the same time, he also, I remember a phrase he used, he said it's not enough to choose Scotland. He said that's a given for a nationalist. You have to make a choice within Scotland. And so he drove the, the, the SNP down the road of being a moderate, and I stress moderate, moderate left of centre, a social democratic pitch to, to counter Labour's hegemony in, in, in the central belt and thereby leading to his victories in 2007 and 11. But there were some divisions within the SNP. Alex, I don't think you buy him in 1990 when he first went to the leadership, did you? No, because I, I felt actually, I mean, he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and he was regularly on the television as the oil economist for the Royal Bank of Scotland. He was a huge asset to the SNP, and of course he was deputy leader, but I felt that Margaret Ewing's experience at the time perhaps was what we needed at that particular time, knowing full well that Alec would be the next leader after that, but, you know, he ran such a brilliant campaign, yeah. and he won overwhelmingly. I think he got two-thirds of the vote. Uh, but he, that, he didn't create any fissure with uh, Margaret Ewing or anyone else. No, uh, you know, he brought everybody into the team as much as he could. But I'll tell you one thing about Alex Salmon. And, you know, there were some things. For example, I, I said to him in the 1999 first election to the Scottish Parliament, I didn't think it was politically the right thing to do to promise the penny for Scotland. 
Uh, but he listened to what you were saying. He might, you know, be very argumentative about it. And 50% of the time, he changed his mind. You could persuade him because, as Joan said, he liked a good argument. He liked to go, go through things rigorously. He didn't just sign off things without asking questions. I mean, the ferries thing, the ferries crisis would never have happened under Alex Salmond. Joan, I mean, the thing is, you won't really have known him quite as well in those days. You would have known him as a journalist in those days. What, what, what did you think of him the first time around and before he became First Minister? I thought he was very impressive. I met him uh, in, in Babbitties with his wife Moira in 1990 when he was running for the leadership and uh, he, um, he, he was looking for support um, and he was incredibly impressive. But before that, as someone who supported the cause of independence, watching him on television, he seemed a completely fresh new voice for young people of my generation who perhaps thought the SNP was, they used to be called the Tartan Tories. And here was this incredibly sharp left to centre guy making these, these practical arguments about economics. And it was like, this is a, a fresh new face. And you know, when he, when he came back to the leadership the second time around, yeah. one thing I remember was that, that, well, the first thing I remember of that time was that he actually had to ask his wife for permission to stand for the leadership <laughs> again. That, right, it it was right so important too. to him. Right but, too. but what changed about the leadership the second time, Brian? Uh, I think that in the first period, his heart really wasn't in it. It was a very difficult election campaign for the SNP. In, in the parliament, in, in the Scottish in, parliament. In, in, in the Scottish Parliament in, in, in 1999. By the time he came back, he, if you remember, he, 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 he refused. He said he wasn't going to take the leadership again. I, th I believe he only came back because he thought the result was perhaps going in a direction that he wouldn't have found particularly amicable for the party. And so he came in with a rather unexpected partnership of Nicola Sturgeon, unexpected to her, I think that is, uh, as a joint leadership. But he said he was, he said that he was only going to come back uh, with the opportunity of being First Minister. It didn't seem very likely at the time, but they won by a single uh, single seat, and I recall the, the, the hub at the top of uh, the Royal Mile standing. I was only a few yards away from covering it for the BBC, and he said, I had a rumour, I think we won the election. But the most amazing one was four years later, against a voting system that was explicitly designed to prevent a party, frankly the SNP, from winning majority power with a minority of the popular vote, and yet he still managed to achieve that and therefore brought about the referendum. But of course, he had a terrific success in being First Minister and then and then. And then majority. He brought about that referendum, he negotiated the terms of the referendum, he conducted a, a powerful campaign, but he fell short. So you have success and failure pretty much in the same voice. And what, I mean, you worked with them behind the scenes. What was the key to that success? Well, briefly. I Force of personality and my most vivid memories are being part of the team around him during that campaign. And he, it was really Alex Salmond as First Minister and the people that he managed to gather to back him. David Murray, who owned Rangers at the time, uh, actually backed Alex Salmond. We'd never have backed the SNP or Independence, but he backed Alex Salmond and he, he, he built this incredible um, consensus. We called it the Big Bothy, <laughs> like the Big Tent, no. that he would reach out to all of Scotland and bring them in. And I think. Scotland walked taller when Alex Salmond became First Minister. He used to say, yeah, I do have a grand conceit of myself, but he believed in himself and he believed in Scotland. And I think that he, he put the Scottish cringe to bed when he became First Minister. But it hasn't all been plain sailing. No. I'm jumping ahead now, Brian. Yeah. Um, you did the interview with him, as did I, at the, the Champagne Inn mm -hmm. after the, the allegations of sexual misconduct, yeah. when he admitted that he was no angel. Yeah, he said to me he was no angel. He said he had flaws, but he was adamant that he'd not uh, 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 committed anything that was remotely close to a crime. I think when we, we talk about divisions, let's make one division. Let's make a distinction between the latter period, as it now uh, tragically is, in my sympathy to, to, to Maura and the family, uh, with that latter period where, where, where they had the, the, there, are, there are decisions that are still seen, they're still disputed. You know, was he right to set up a new party? He believes it was cooperative to the movement. The SNP leadership, frankly, saw it as divisive and un unhelpful. Uh, was he um, b behaving responsibly to, towards colleagues and particularly towards women? Or was it, as he suspected, a, an orchestrated campaign against him? Those questions are still there and they're still disputed. But the overall legacy is not disputed. So the legacy of someone who 
won two elections to the Scottish Parliament, who brought about a referendum, took Scotland to the verge of independence, and is frankly seen as a giant within Scottish politics, whatever the disputatious nature of the view of that latter period. Alex, facts are chills that win a ding. The facts that Brian's talking about stand, don't they? But there was still that problem over the last few years, which seems to have, for so many people, tarnished his memory. Well, I think the tragedy is that he was starting to overcome that, actually. He was back in the fray. Uh, and if you go back to the reason for setting up Alaba, it, it was a logical thing. It wasn't a, you know, a personal ego trip or anything like that. And the, and the, the objective of Alba, I'm, I'm in the SNP, I'm not in Alba, so I don't speak as somebody who's prejudiced in favour of Alba. But the, the logic behind it was, uh, in the post-referendum situation, to be able to move the independence agenda forward, we should try to get uh, a supermajority in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, because uh, if we had a supermajority, particularly if you could get up to about 86 members, two-thirds of the parliament, then and the, and the parliament was controlled, if you like, by the pro-independence people to that extent, um, although it may be some time before you would get another referendum, uh, if that's the right way to do it the next time rather than the election, it, the point is the parliament would have been very, it would have been super powerful, a supermajority. That's not what you're thinking about 2026, though. You're not thinking no, that's no, likely No, I'm not saying now. that, but if you go back to the reason why, Alex, because he discussed it with me, uh, and that was his logic behind right. it, and his logic was right. I'm going to move on to, away from the politics a wee bit, to the cultural side yes. of Alex Salmon, because he really did have that. I mean, there was, I mean, he, he, he thought of himself as having been a boy soprano. He really fancied himself <laughs> as a singer, didn't he? And here he is with Anne Lauren Gillis. Oh, my goodness. He did fancy himself as a bit of a singer. He also <laughs> fancied, himself, fancied himself as a bit of a wit and rack on tour, though, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was a boy soprano. He was very pr proud of that. When he opened my parliamentary office in Dumfries in 2012, I arranged for the local community choir to greet him as he arrived in Dumfries High Street. But instead of listening to what they were singing, he joined in. <laughs> but he also invited them. Uh, he said, "I would. You were fantastic. We'll have you up in Edinburgh." And he stood by his word, and they sang a, a, a really big award ceremony in Edinburgh Castle, um, which is a memory that none of them, none of them will forget. But he was also quite funny. He did a great "I am jolly" impersonation. Yeah, yeah. He was often in "Have I Got News for You," Brian. He, yeah. he was extremely funny. He, he actually um, did, a, did a, speak, a speech at the, the centenary of the great. And mighty Dundee United and it went down an absolute <laughs> bomb but look uh, the, the, the singing there I'm a bit guilty of that myself occasionally singing in public and, and like Alec it's, it's, it, even the pleading of concerned friends can't stop us when we're determined to sing that's a lot better than I remember it I've got, a a, I've got to say you. hey hey I'll give you the road in the miles to Dundee and it's absolutely beautiful but that's a lot a lot better than I remember it that was rather rather fine yes. rather fine well, what, what do you remember about that because he could be fun and oh, presumably he was, he was quite fun with, uh, with you guys behind the scenes absolutely he was great fun uh, and he liked to laugh and he could he could take a laugh against himself you know this idea that Alec was always you know you know bad temper and all the rest of it of course there were times when he got frustrated but actually it was a good job he was a hard taskmaster he wouldn't have achieved what he achieved if he had not been a hard taskmaster but once you get the work done he unwound and you know he was great company he had a lot of good jokes and he could take a joke against himself one person i was speaking to last night who used to work with him was telling me that during the 2015 election they were driving all over the place and he was they were trying to work out having a debate what's the best day to die alex salmon said it was a saturday because then you got all the sunday papers if you were big enough <laughs> he was yes and he did uh, thanks all for joining us in scotland tonight because that's all from scotland tonight we'll be here tomorrow until then from all of us in the studio. Goodbye.